بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. Welcome to this new series. It's going to be inshallah a very informative series and we're going to try and be as original as possible in this series. It's not a seerah which is going to be like a story setting, storytelling style. It's going to be a seerah where we're going to be trying to critically assess each of the claims, implicit or explicit, that are made by uh, the seerah writers or by our tradition. So in other words, we're not going to come from a confessionary perspective. We're coming from a perspective of someone that is actually critical of the seerah. And that's why in the first lesson today, what we're going to go through is effectively the existence of the Prophet Muhammad himself. Because if you think about it, right, a lot of the new atheist or even skeptical historical revisionist, orientalist type of narrative has been, these religious stories, they're exactly just that. Religious stories, mythologies, fictions. They're useful fictions. And we don't need to believe in these things at all. So what we're going to be going through is, number one, how can we prove that the Prophet Muhammad even existed? What are the claims being made on the other side? Because we need to have an exposure of this. And the, the utility of that for us, for our purposes is, it will, inshallah, increase the yaqeen that we have, the, the certainty that we have of Islam. In fact, you'll find going through the slides that we're going to be going through today, inshallah, that there's such a rich, you know, plethora of evidences relating to the historicity of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of Islam, uh, which I w would rival anything in the antiquity or Middle, middle Ages, uh, anything at all, not just religious information, but any information at all. So when we, for, before we get started, let's um, maybe just do a critical introduction here, the first slide, uh, and talk about something which a group of historians have come out in the 1970s chief most among which was uh, Patricia Crone, Croner and Michael Cook. And Croner, she wrote a book called Hagarism in the 1970s. And in this book, in the first instance, she actually was making the claim that the Prophet Muhammad doesn't exist. Why does she say this? I mean, uh, this is a very radical claim, even for Orientalist standards, by the way. Like, within the Orientalists, this is not a normal claim. It's a very, very radical claim. She said, if you put, like, effectively, she was saying, if you put all of this kind of traditional narratives, the hadiths and the seerah and all this kind of stuff, if you put it to one side, okay, what are we actually left with? We're left with manuscripts, we're left with coins, we're left with, you know, all these kinds of inscriptions. And it would seem to be that Islam was invented at least, you know, 50 to 100 years afterwards, before the time that it was meant to be. So it's important to know the timelines here. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died 11 AH. The Hijrah, this is a calendar, which as we're going to cover, inshallah, it started with the migration from Mecca to Medina. Okay, so that's when the calendar started. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died 11 years after the Hijrah. And so that's why it's 11 AH. And this is commensurate with 632, a Gregorian calendar. So just bear in mind these two dates because they're going to be important when we're covering some of the slides today. So that's... 11 AH, which is the same as 632. What, what Patricia Croner and Michael Cook and some of their students came out and said is that, look, actually, Islam really was invented afterwards. And she had this very elaborate theory about there being some kind of an alliance between Jewish people and Muslim people. And that Islam was actually an alliance. Uh, the, the, the Muslims and Jewish alliance tried to overtake Jerusalem. And in fact... Uh, you, you, th th these narratives were invented and so on and so forth. Patricia Croner actually, because of certain manuscripts that came out, from my understanding, it was actually the Sana'a manuscript that changed her whole mind about this. She actually retracted her position. And so she does believe, even she, the most radical, skeptical mind, came to believe that actually the Prophet ﷺ does exist and she retracted a lot of her earlier theories. Very interesting. So... We're talking about, you know, what the forerunner of, uh, you know, historical revisionism in the West. So that's one thing. Really interesting. I was looking at some of the argumentations that she was making in her book. And uh, she makes some interesting arguments, but it's interesting for our purposes 
because you'll see that actually this feeds into some of the confessionary narratives. She says, look, if you look at the Quran, you'll find it's not compatible with the historical context. So remember, from their perspective, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he wasn't a prophet, from their perspective. From their perspective, he wasn't revealed, no information was revealed to him from God. In fact, from their perspective, he's making this thing up himself. So she's saying, if you think about it, if you look at the Quran in Surah, uh, for example, Al-Araf, chapter 7, it's talking about Sabbath breaking. It's, and this is meant to be a Meccan Surah. Why is it in a Meccan Surah, is it discussing things relating to Jewish people? There wasn't even a Jewish population there. So she's saying, like, it's not, it doesn't connect with the primary audience. And then she goes on to say, even agriculturally and contextually, like you find that the references that are being made, yes, are of certain ge geographic features which were not not um, available to or were not applicable to the Prophet Sallallahu character or to his uh, his condition or con context. For example, there's references which are more numerous and vivid. She says to the sea, but in Arabia there's, there's not this kind of sea. Saying like in, in the location, why is there so many references in the Quran to the sea? Moreover, why, why is why is the Quran talk about olives so much? Well, we know for a fact, she says, Arabian Peninsula doesn't have olives, and it cannot even produce olives and pomegranates. Why does the Quran talk about these fruits? She said, it, it wouldn't make sense if the Quran was context specific to talk about these fruits, which the people, the primary audience, are not connecting with. But you can see how this can lend itself to an argument that we can make okay, from the confessionary side. So actually, you're making the argument for us. Because it would indicate, I mean, obviously, one could argue from the confessionary side or from the faithful side, this would indicate that the, the readership was not intended to only be the primary readership of the Qur'an. It's true. Why is it that, in a, <laughs> with a group of Patricia, say, look, it's true, you're right to say, why is it that the Qur'an is talking about these fruits and these landscapes and these geographic locations, which are not really applicable to the primary audience. It would indicate that the author of the Quran was intending this information for other than the primary audience, which is the Sahaba. So you see, it's an own goal, really. It's a, and you're going to see a lot of these own goals being committed by these skeptical minds. And that's why I think actually looking at these Orientalists and looking at these revisionists is actually quite useful. Because it's, isn't that an irony that the more you make an argument against Islam, sometimes you find that these arguments themselves are the arguments for Islam. <laughs> if you can really think about what you're saying here, right? So, this is one thing. She says, look, for example, if you look at Surah Al-Kahf, chapter 18, the, verse 32, it's talking about, you know, the, the man with the gardens. I'm sure you've, you guys have read it and seen it. So, it's gardens, there's no greenery in Arabia. At that time, there wasn't. Now, there's more, and I mean, if you, and that's what prophecy, as you maybe we'll cover, that the greening of the Arabian Peninsula. But at that time, there was, there really wasn't. So why is the Quran speaking about gardens so much, and with good detail, as if the primary audience should connect with such information? It's true. Why is it? Because the Quran was intended. <laughs> we would, we would argue, right? So we continue. So some of her conclusions were the following. There was no caliph called Abu Bakr. Bear in mind this. I mean, you're going to find that this is a bit ludicrous. And that the Prophet ﷺ lived after 632. So he lived. He didn't die at 632. He continued living after 632. That the Prophet and Jews had this hyper-alliance and attempted together to claim Jerusalem as we've mentioned. And Mecca wasn't the center of Islamic civilization, but it was somewhere else, maybe no north, north of the Arabian Peninsula. These are some of her conclusions. However, having said that, there is a plethora of evidences that we can put, use to our disposal. And even if we use her approach, and that's what I'm saying, let's use Patricia's approach and let's go with it for the sake of argument. And it's not just Patricia has come to this conclusion, this very unusual conclusion of there being no Abu Bakr or whatever, is some of like some of our followers or some people that are influenced by, by her. But even if we use this approach, that, let's put aside the hadith. 
You guys Muslims believe in the hadith We're going to talk about the hadith Well you guys believe in the hadith Let's put aside the hadith we're only, we're only concerned with manuscripts And we're not even concerned with the histories of the Arabs Which by the way frankly is quite a racist and colonial thing Because why should it be that we have to have like a white man to tell us what history was anyway no, it's, it's Effectively that, that's what you're telling us It's like, you know, we only accept histories from the Persians or not even them Let's be honest, let's, let's say the Romans It's got to be from a Roman resource It's got to be another language It cannot be the Arabic language because if, if it's that language, we know it's all, you know, conspiracy or confessionary or whatever, faithful. Or, and of course, if we did the same, if we flipped the switch on them and said, okay, let's do the same thing with the English. Uh, Henry V or Henry VIII or whatever it is, we're not going to accept any English sources. Let's just accept Gaelic sources or something like that. And let's see where we, are, we end up with your histories. Let's see what the white man's history is going to look like. We don't accept your own language history. But anyway, for the sake of argument. I'm, I'm going with it. We have the following sources to our disposal. The first one is the fragments of the Arab conquests. Now, this was actually, it was written 636 AD. Now, remember, we said that the Prophet was, died when? 632. So when is this? Four years after the Prophet is Very, 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 very recent. Very close to the death of the Prophet Muhammad And in it, not only is this a primary source, but it's a primary source with the name Muhammad in it in a different language. And this is what it says. Actually, it was the Battle of Yarmouk, which, funny enough, was the battle that who was engaged in? Who was the Khalifa at that time? Abu Bakr Siddiq. Abu Bakr Siddiq. Yes? So, this shows you another issue here. With, uh, and the following was said, yes? In January, the people of Homs took... This is actually the, this is a translation... A translation uh, it's been translated by, uh, what's his name, Robert uh, Holden, or I forget his surname now, but I'll come to it in a second. Who was a, who, who was a student of Patricia Krona, and he's seen as the, the top guy now, and he's written a book called uh, Early Islamic History or something like that. He's, he translates these texts. Is it Robert Ho Hoyland? Hoyland, yeah, yeah, that's right, Robert Hoyland. Yeah, so Robert Hoyland is a student of Patricia Krona, and he's translated this, I think. It's, uh, he says the following. Well, the, tr uh, the translation of it is like, In January, the people of Homs took the word for their lives, and many villages were ravaged by the killing of the Arabs of Muhammad. The Arabs of Mah Muhammad, as is mentioned. Okay. And many people were slain and taken prisoner from Galilee as far as Beth. On the 26th of May, the such and such went from the vicinity of Homs, and the Roman chased them. On the 10th, of August, the Romans fled from the vicinity of Damascus and they were killed, many people, some 10,000. And at the turn of the year, the Romans came. On the 12th of August in the year 947, they gathered in Gabitha, Gabitha is Yarmouk, by the way, a multitude of Romans and many people of the Romans were killed, some 50,000. This is very, very interesting for many, more than one reason. Number one, it's actually commensurate with the Islamic report. Like, you know, the, 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 the Battle of Yarmouk, for, for, as per our traditions, is exactly like this. And someone will be tempted to say, well, these Arabs, for example, they are exaggerating their histories. They're saying that they defeated the Romans and they did this and they did that. They're exaggerating their histories. But now you have a Roman source saying the same exact thing. And, and the key and critical point here is the Arabs of Muhammad. So much so that some of these Orientalists have been trying to say, look, it's this Arabs of Muhammad that gives you more credence that he was still alive at the time. But that's not necessarily so. There's nothing to indicate in that phraseology that he was still alive. But they, they were ascribed to him in one way or another. This is a key manuscript information which indicates without a shadow of a doubt that there was a man called Muhammad, that there were, there were people fighting on behalf of his cause. And that the, the histories of the battles of Yarmouk, as per the Islamic tradition, are the same histories that you're finding in these traditions as well. Hijab, is this written in the fragments of the Arab conquest? Yeah, that's, that's the one. That's what it's written, yeah? Yeah. So what this is, is actually, the, the actual fragment was in <clears throat> the Gospel of Mark. Funny enough, ironically enough. The Bible wasn't preserved, but the Bible is being used to preserve the Islam. <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting, huh? The Gospel itself hasn't been preserved. But the, 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 the falsified or unpreserved Gospels are being used to preserve Islam in another way, which is the Gospel of Mark. 
And all of this stuff is made because they used to have like a, these parchments and stuff like that, and it was written on there. So that's the first one. The second one, the Chronicle of 640 by Thomas the Presbyter, states the following. Now, 640, how many years are we talking here? Eight years, Eight years after Prophet's death. Now, that's very, very, very close. And as we'll see, you don't find stuff like this in Christianity at all. You wish to find something that was eight years after Jesus. That's from another... No chance. And it's manuscript evidence. And it says the following. In the year 945, in Diction 7, on Friday the 4th of February, at the ninth hour, there was a battle between the Romans and the Tayyai of Muhammad. Now Tayyai, the Arabs of Muhammad, uh, Hoyland, he, he actually, he does the translation for this. He's, he's written in his book. It's been peer-reviewed. Some pe I don't think there's much discussion about the Syriac here, Tayaya, what it means. And so here, once again, in Palestine, 12 miles east of Gaza, the Romans fled, leaving behind Patrician Bryden, whom the Arabs killed. Some 4,000 poor villages of Palestine were killed there, Christians, Jews, and Samaritans. The Arabs ravaged the whole region. In the year 947, the Arabs invaded the whole Syria and went down to Persia and conquered it. The Arabs climbed the mountain of Mardin and killed many monks there in the monasteries of Kedar and Nata. There died a blessed man, Simon, doorkeeper of Kedar, brother of Thomas, the priest. So Muhammad is mentioned again in a very early source by Thomas the Presbyter. So that's another primary. And by the way, there's lots of these, but I'm just giving you three from non-Islamic sources, just so that you can have them in your arsenal. Because someone will ask you, what is the evidence? According to our method, I'm telling you, this is the evidence according to the method of today. We're not going hadith. We're not going there. We're, we're, we're sticking with manuscripts, non-Arabic written. We're giving you all your criteria. And yet we're still coming to this. And by the way, these are housed in the British Museum and the British Library. I mean, this is not like the, the manuscripts of these things are in some place in Baghdad or Cairo where maybe there's some guy who forged it or put, uh, you know, made it up. It's, it's, it's right there. You can, anyone can visit and go to the British Museum and see it in public exhibition. This one here is written in 661, which is a bit later, but the, the amount of detail on this by Cebius, it's, and he wrote a book called The History of Heraclius, yeah? It's actually quite startling. So let me read some of what he said. At the time, a certain man from among the, those same sons of Is, uh, Ishmael, whose name was Muhammad, وسلم, a merchant, as if by God's command, appeared to them as a preacher and the path of truth. He taught them to recognize the God of Abraham, especially because he was learnt and informed in the history of Moses. Now, because the command was from on high, at a single order, they all came together in unity of religion, abandoning their vain cults. They turned to the living God, who had appeared to their father Abraham. So Muhammad legislated for them not to eat carrion, not to drink wine, not to speak falsely, and not to engage in fornication. He said with an oath, God promised this land to Abraham and his seed after him forever. And he brought about as he promised during that time while he loved Israel, but now you are the sons of Abraham and God is accomplishing his promise to Abraham and his seed for you. Love sincerely only the God of Abraham and go and seize the land which God gave to your father Abraham. No one will be able to resist you in battle because God is with you. This is amazing detail, isn't it? This is not from an Arab source. This is Cebius himself. So these are some of the evidences that we've got here. And there are more. The doctrine of Jacobi and, and so on. The reason why I brought these ones in particular, and there are so many more, is because these ones actually mention the word Muhammad in them. And they're very, very early. So all the criterion are met. So what more do we want? I mean, we have a whole list of different things that are mentioned here. Now, in addition to this, you have a range of coins being minted. Now, of course, this, like, for example, if we were to compare this with early Christianity, there is no coin with Jesus on it in the first hundred years of Jesus because Jesus wasn't in political power. So they don't have the privilege of having any coins that they can use to corroborate even the existence of Jesus 
whereas we do have coins. And really and truly, the first coin with the word Muhammad on it was uh, actually at the time of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, 66 AH, some 50 years after the Prophet Muhammad's death. However, really and truly, there were coins with other symbols on them and other phrases which are known to the Muslims. For example, the Basmala, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, or Bismillah, or Lillah, Lillah for Allah. So these coins were there. The, the first coin with the word Muhammad on it that I came across looking at the primary source evidence was one in 66 AH, which is pretty early indeed. Now, there are some interesting things about coins. And what I'm going to mention about that is that really what's interesting and why people have discussed it is you'll find that some of the coins, it was an amalgamation, okay, of like Persian symbol symbolism, sometimes Roman symbolism and Islamic symbolism. So you'll find in some of the early coins, you have like the Qaisar on it. And then you also have Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, for example. Or you'll have, uh, some, in some cases, you even have a cross on some of them. So how could an Islamic coin have a cross on it? How could an Islamic coin have uh, uh, these symbols of the Persians on it? How could it be? And the answer is this. It's simply that these were the symbols that the people of those nations were, were used to. If you found a piece of silver, which didn't have this, a dirham, a dirham or a dinar, that didn't have this sim symbolism on it, it would not be recognized as a coin. It would not be accepted or traded as a coin by those people. And hence, it would not fulfill its function of being a coin. And moreover, the, the machines that they were using to mint those coins had those symbols on them. To create new machines all over the empire, in the new empire, was not practical. And this shows you, by the way, that the Sahaba must have therefore been very practical and pragmatic. You see, we have this notion, nostalgic and false notion about the Sahaba, that they were extremely intolerant and incapable of any kind of, uh, of, of pragmatism. But for them to have, and this was historically on the record, coins which had some symbols of shirk on them, sometimes, but because it was ta'adhar al-amr, because the situation became so difficult that you couldn't even trade without those coins, you can see usul fiqh in practice at the time of the Sahaba, the early generation. That certainly things were of necessity make what is halal haram. You'll find that if someone tried this nowadays, they wouldn't accept this. As if they're more pious than the pious predecessors. Because they have a false notion, a nostalgic false notion of what the pious, uh, pious predecessors are. Surely, yes, they were. It's true. Abu Bakr Siddiq was very staunch on certain issues. And we'll come to maybe some of that. And the pious predecessors were very staunch and non-compromising on certain issues. But where it became where it came at the threat of the political uh, supremacy of the Islamic civilization, they didn't actually, uh, they, they engaged in pragmatic politics. And that's very clear. You have coins with uh, symbols of shirk on there. And, but but it was, because it was so difficult to change it across the empire and it was free-flowing and stuff, they just used it and put as much Islamic things as they could. Wattaqullah mastata'atum. Simple as that, really. But the reason why I'm bringing this to your attention is because someone will say, well, it doesn't make sense that, uh, that the first coins that you have are coins with, for example, uh, both of these things. It shows that Islam was still a developing religion. It's still, yeah, because remember, the, the Orientalist wants to say Islam was maybe was actually crafted at the time of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. Some of them have said this. I've seen, as we've got to cover his, some of his works, Stephen Shoemaker. Yeah, sure, that's his name. Right? But we'll, we'll come to it. He, he kind of makes this kind of um, point and he, he's got academic pieces and stuff. We'll come to it. He's a very interesting guy to read, actually. Orient, anti kind of Islamic narrative or Orientalist type of the Christian guy. That actually Islam was developed in the, uh, the time of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. But as we've said, there's enough information from the first 10 years of the Prophet Sam's death, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, that not only mention his name, but mention very specific things about his mission. So that, that was before Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. If we say Abdul Malik ibn Marwan was, for example, you know, I don't know, 65 AH or something like that. That's why it's important to know the timeline. He's an Umawi at the time of the Umayyads. But way before that, we have primary source information from non-Muslims that indicate the name of the Prophet and the mission of the Prophet. Of course, in addition to, and we're going to come to this, the manuscripts we have, the Quran, and the manuscripts we have, and the Hadith manuscripts, 
and, and, and not just manuscripts, the hadith itself and the sanads and all that kind of stuff, which we believe. But that's coming from a confessionary Islamic perspective. And we're granting, for the sake of argument, all of the premises that the historical revisionist wants us to take. We're saying, even if you grant all of that, you're still wrong. So we're going to the next, uh, next thing. So coins are an interesting thing, but you need to kind of know what's going on with them. And these are some pictures of the coins. I mean, I've put them there. Uh, they're very, very, um, you, you can buy them. Like, you can buy a coin like this for about £100. You know, Adnan Rashid, our friend, is, he, mashallah, he's got a very a nice coin collection. And you can see, if you want to see these coins, uh, yani, if you want to touch them and stuff, and get some coins and you can, you can touch them. Okay. <laughs> you can touch them and feel them. Okay. Yes. Uh, inscriptions. Another thing is, which has become more, there's so many inscriptions. <coughs> The f like there's, there's actually a few very important inscriptions of the early days. One of them is the inscription of Zebedee. And another one is this inscription of Zuhair, of 24 AH. And this inscription, if we say it's 24 AH, we're talking about the time of Umar ibn Khattab. And the inscription says that Umar ibn Khattab died on this, this time, whatever, like th at this time period. Uh, and this is in line with the Islamic narrative. I Zuhair wrote this at the time Muhammad died in the year 24 AH. And this is in line with our calendar and our rendering of when Amr al-Khattab died. So these are the kinds of inscriptions there. Now, there, it's true to say when Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, for example, when he became in power, the inscriptions exploded, especially in Masjid al-Aqsa. There started being inscriptions all over the walls and all these kind of things. But inscriptions was not a practice, really, of the Arabs that they would go and write stuff on rocks and stuff like that. It wasn't something they did. It wasn't their culture to go and write stuff. But even despite that, notwithstanding that being the fact, you still do have these inscriptions. So, look, you have a triangulation of evidences here. That's what I'm coming to. You've got coins, you've got inscriptions, you've got early manuscripts from non-Muslim sources. And it becomes so much that someone like Patricia Krona, who's meant to be like the most aberrational historical revisionist, that even about her... Fred Bonner, who's meant to be someone who's also orientalist, he says that she asked all the right questions, but she had all the wrong, wrong answers. Now, even he admits, and she came back to her senses, had to come back to her senses. This you will never find. And I keep challenging, you can never ever find such levels of preservation from different sources in any other ancient world religion, which is dominant in the world demographic today. Hinduism, no chance. Judaism. Absolutely no chance whatsoever. We're going to come to that near the end of it. And that's why I actually get enraged that, you know, if you have a discussion with a Jew and he, he tries to compare Jewish preservation with this, it's actually comical. It's comical. It's a lie. And obviously Christianity as well. This is the picture of the inscription. Um, yeah. Now, some people say, look, and you've heard this, uh, you probably heard this before. You say, look, the first seerah, yes, was Ibn Hisham. So a lot of people make this mistake. Actually, it's not even the case that the first seerah was Ibn Hisham or Ibn Ishaq, because Ibn Ishaq has been preserved in Ibn Hisham. It's not the case that Ibn Ishaq has been preserved. It's not that, it's not even the first manuscript we have. It's not true. That, that is um, not understanding even the manuscript evidence. Because we've got seerahs before Ibn Hisham. For example, we have Musa ibn Aqba. And he had something called al maghazi and that was 141. So that's even that ma'luma, that particular piece of information is incorrect. We have manuscripted seerahs that go to 141. Now, the seerah doesn't mean that all the hadith was not there and then this guy made it all up. Of course, we've had the hadith tradition, and we'll come to this of uh, Asanid, of chains of narration from the time of the Prophet. Now, he just wrote a book compiling that stuff at 141, and that's the earliest manuscript of an entire story of the Prophet that we have. It doesn't mean that the Hadith were not there. The Hadith were there. For even manuscript evidence of the Hadith was there before. For example, the, Sah the Sahifa of Hammad ibn Ibn Munabbih. And we have partial manuscripts of uh, Ibn uh, Munabbih found near Aswan. And you'll find them actually, uh, yani some of them in Berlin, some of them in different places. Hammam Ibn Munabbih was actually the student of Ibu, uh, Abu Hurairah. 
he was born 19 AH, which is, as you can probably add the numbers now, nine years after the Prophet, eight years after the Prophet's death. Eight years after the Prophet's death, we have manuscripts attributed to a person who's a student of Abu Hurairah. This is even manuscripts. But of course, manuscripts are not the only thing. I mean, um, we have absorption and incorporation. So, for example, it's not the fact that, okay, you don't have the manuscript, that, that the thing is not preserved. We don't believe in that. So, for example, in Bukhari, there are things which are, were manuscripts at the time. Bukhari put it into his book. We don't have the original manuscript, but we have Bukhari. And so why wouldn't that count, if that makes sense? Even on a manuscript level, we have things the same thing in Tirmidhi. We have the same things in uh, Sunan Nasari. We have different Sunan that the same thing applies. It's called absorption and incorporation. So, for example, the Sahifa, as sadiq of Amr ibn al-As is included as part of Musnad Ahmad. Now, obviously, Ahmad ibn Hanbal died 241. It's very for, for long. But at his time, he had access to that. He had that Sahifa in front of him. He had that particular manuscript in front of him. He wrote it down. We have it now. So he copied something which was a physical paper. Because this, there is a misconception that in Islam, everything was through oral transmission. That everything was Chinese whispers or oral transmission or this kind of things. It's false. There were entire manuscripts that were copied by writing from one hadith scholar to another. And this is, I'm giving you examples that this is by no means an exhaustive list. But Amr ibn as you know, is Sahabi. The Sahif of Ali ibn Abi Talib is included within Bukhari. And so on and so forth. Like the book of Zakat written by Abu Bakr Siddiq is included in Al-Bukhari and so on. So we have that. We have manuscripts, people, and there's so many of those that were written by the Ashab of, or of the Sunans and the, uh, the Jama'as and the Hadiths and uh, all these particular books of Hadith. And we're still sticking with the script here. And we, yani for us, I should mention, we don't accept that this is the... Yani, our, our method, as we'll come to see, is much more rigorous much harder than their method. You find the manuscript somewhere and you can attribute something to someone. You'll find that our method is actually much more, it's much more critical than this. The Hadith method is much more critical than this. But we're sticking with this. Why? Because it's what modern historians are used to. So we're giving them this anyway. And obviously one thing that was a recent discovery in 2015 was the Birmingham manuscript. Now it's very significant for a historian. For me it's not, hist and for you and for the faithful believers, it shouldn't be very significant. Because we don't base our faith on this. But we're making the argument. And we're saying, look, it's 95%. It's carbon dated to a degree of 95%. To within the life of the Prophet It's carbon dated to a degree of 95% to within the life of the Prophet And, which is 568 to 654 by the University of Oxford. And it's in the University of Birmingham. Once again, it's, it's in a Western University. Now, that's a manuscript. And it is two folios, it's two pages, but it's commensurate with what we have. Now, we have other manuscripts, obviously, the, the most complete one is the top copy one. And that's, people think it's Uthman's. It's not Uthman's one, this is like once, uh, one century after the Prophet uh, death. But it has basically 99.9% .9 or 99.5% of the Quran. And it's a manuscript. And it's in line with what we're reciting today. And so, you have a perfect match between the surahs that are in the Birmingham manuscript with that which is in the top copy manuscript, and there's a 99 point, uh, all of the Qur'an is, is there. And then you have 95% radiocarbon dating to the time of the Prophet. What more do you want? I mean, to be honest with you, what more do you want? Yani, for a historian that's studying ancient, if they found this for the Bible, imagine you found something attributed to Jesus in the first, within his life, two sc uh, scrolls. They would be, the Christians would have a good, uh, they would, I don't know what they would do. Uh, unbelievable. There's no chance you're going to find anything like that in the first hundred years of Christianity. No chance at all, yani. And so, subhanAllah, sometimes Allah uses the Orientalists, the historical revisionists, as a jundi, as a way to actually make Islam true, as a way of preserving the religion. And no one knows the junood of Allah except for Him. Some, Allah can do tasheer of a uh, disbeliever to serve the religion of Islam. And so an Orientalist can serve the religion of Islam. 
he tries to attack it and actually he starts to realize there's more than this going on. And this is a good example of that. And this is an image of the manuscript here. Look how chunky it looks. It looks, I actually love this image. I mean, it looks very crisp, really beautiful writing. Imagine if they had a Bible looking like that. Imagine if they had it. I mean, imagine if you had something like the Old Testament that they, even their process of choosing what books go into the book, the, the, the Bible, it's arbitrary. Athanasius did it in the fourth century. There's no even council that did it, let alone have a book like this, full manuscript like that. I mean, let's be honest, man. I want to tell you something else, and this is almost a waste of time, but I need to mention it just because you need to be aware of the, you need to be aware of the kinds of discourses that Orientalists in the academy and outside of the academy are putting forward. There's a guy called Dan Gibson. And what he tried to say is that, look, Mecca is an imaginary place. It's an imaginary place because if you look at the masjids, at the, yani the early Islam, they were not actually pointed to Mecca at all. In fact, they were pointed, <laughs> sorry to say, they were pointed to Petra. So which means that the Qibla was actually not towards Mecca, but towards Petra itself. Okay, now he thought he was being, you know, very... He wants to be the next Patricia Crona, of course, you know. He wants to say something ridiculous. But he was refuted by his own peers. David King, who's a historian of uh, some standing, in, uh, I think it's King's University, but I can't remember if it's King's or not, but he contributed to Britannica, or the Encyclopedia of Islam. And even Dan Gibson, when he was trying to quote him, he quoted him incorrectly. Yeah, he refuted that Gibson, and I'm going to read some of the things that he said. He said Gibson published his book Quranic Geography in 2011. In it, he proved his own satisfaction that the Quran contains so few references to actual locations, including Mecca, that its origins must lie somewhere else, namely uh, Petra. Funnily enough, the authoritative Encyclopedia of Islam has no entry for Petra, for nothing of consequence in early Islamic history happened there. So. Gibson then briefly discussed some 30 early mosques which according to him faced towards Petra and not towards Mecca. His argumentation was weak indeed, not least because he did not present any orientations. The bibliography did not include a single work on the Qibla. This is now David King responding to Dan Gibson. Gibson's new book contains dazzling array of information and plans of some 60 early mosques treated more or less in chronological order but therefore not by region and is intended to show how the earliest mosque faced Petra, then between Petra and Mecca, then the false Qibla towards Mecca with variations on theme. He says, Gibson wishes to ingratiate himself with Muslim readers by showing by means of, of a survey of early mosque orientations that these early mosques are correctly aligned. But the catch is that they are correctly aligned towards Petra, but they are not. The quoted passage asserts that the Qibla of the companions of the Prophet who built the first mosque in Egypt was towards winter sunrise, not Petra. Gibson errs in thinking that the Qibla is towards the black stone, rather the Kaaba is towards the Kaaba itself. Gibson completely misunderstands my findings on the determination of the Qibla and mosque's orientation. Essentially, I found that Muslims for the first two centuries used folk astronomy, particularly astronomical horizon phenomena, the cardinal directions in solar risings and settings at, uh, at sol solstices. Thereafter, they used Qiblas based on geographic coordinates and mathematical procedures. I claim that all mosques face the Qibla in ways of which we can now only understand. I will also say that early mosques do not face directions we modern we moderns think they should. Now Gibson, sorry, now uh, 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 where is it? Now Gibson to claim they face Petra and accurately at that. He continues. You know, you can read it. Maybe I should. Continue. Gibson's book is not, actually this is interesting, Gibson's book is not a scholarly work, for, for its text is of the kind one would expect from a first year college student. <laughs> okay, college students, yeah. Where my works are quoted and misquoted, it is unclear who is the author. Gibson is not competent to write on early Islamic history and often misinterprets the very few serious sources he does consult. I counter Gibson's uh, agnostic 
ontological tour de force with, some, with the simple argument that the earliest Muslims could not have aligned mosques accurately towards Petra or for that matter towards Mecca either. It is even easier to demolish Gibson's necessary backup thesis, which is that the first generations of Muslims had all necessary technical equipment, trigonometry, geometry, geographic coordinates, astronomical instrument, uh, instrumentation to derive the direction of Petra accurately for any locality for, from Andalus to China. He's basically saying, how could they know if they're so far off in the Kaaba, where the Kaaba is, where the Qibla is? How did they know the direction of the Qibla? Because, you know, the astrolabes and these kind of things were invented much after. I mean, the, direct, the things that would help orientate someone to know where the Qibla actually is. So he's saying that, obviously, we're looking at, he's looking at Google Maps, I don't know what he's looking at, and he, yes, Gibson, and he's saying, oh look, it's, it's not actually towards, huh? It's not actually, <laughs> it's, it's more like that. So he must he's saying, it must be, that's, that's his, as if these guys, they had the same ability, like they had like a compass on their phones and they all brought, brought it out and they said, oh, so they must be bringing that way. This is Gibson. <laughs> this is Gibson for you. I mean, this is what they have to say. Now, even their own guys that they say is not even a college student. Would a first year college student <laughs> would, would, would dare make a comment like this, Yanni? So the point is that these are the kinds of embarrassing things that they are, they are led to because they want to mention something new. But the truth of the matter is that Mecca, you ask, what's the evidence of Mecca then? Tell me the evidence of Mecca. I had this conversation with one, I don't know if I want to expose him or not, but one very famous historian in a setting. Yeah, in a, in a particular, in a university setting. I'm not going to expose him. Because it's, but he write books and this and that. He wrote a book on Ibn Taymiyyah and he's from Jewish background. And it's not John Hoover. But anyway, it's because he's very famous about Ibn Taymiyyah. It's someone else. And he said, like, Mecca's not even mentioned in the Quran. I said, yes, it is, actually. <laughs> he said, where? <laughs> he said, it's not Mecca, it's Mecca. I said, it's mentioned Mecca. It's also mentioned Mecca, actually, as well in the Quran. He said, well, I said, Bibatni Mecca. It's an ayah in Surah Al-Fatih. It's, it's mentioned. And he looked at it and I was like, is this the end of the argument? <laughs> is this it? Is, is this how easy it is? You just have to know one ayah. He says, it's not mentioned in the Quran. I told him the ayah. But I'll give you one better. I mean, the Quran, obviously, they'll say it's been invented by Abdul Malik ibn Nuran and maybe Hajjaj ibn Thaqafi and they all came in and made the Quran. Which makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, by the way, because a lot of the Quran is, you know, it's talking about the future in a certain way, it's talking about the present in a certain way. It doesn't even make sense to posit this. But let's say for the sake of argument. Interestingly, you'll find that there's evidence of Mecca in Christian literature. And this is very powerful. So I'm going to give you some interesting uh, points. This is Clark's commentary on the Bible. And this is the blessing. Where, wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Sire unto them. And he shined from Mount Paran. And he came with 10,000 of saints from his right hand and went a fiery law for them. So where is this Paran? You ask the biblical scholar. They've got two opinions on where Paran is. Maybe there's two Parans, actually. There's actually it seems to me that there's two Parans. Like sometimes you have one, a city, more than one city with one name. Like Alexandria, where I'm from. There's many Alexandria. I, was, I wrote down something. When I was in, in Egypt, I said, how do I get from Alexandria to... Uh, they were giving me these things in, in America. There's Alexandria in America. So sometimes you have a city, like London. There's a London somewhere in Canada. You know, there's sometimes a city, more than one name for a city. Paran is one of those kind of cities. But look at what the biblical scholars are saying. He dwelt in the wilderness of Paran. This is generally allowed to have been a part of the desert belonging to Arabian uh, Petria in the vicinity of Mount Sinai. So let's see some of the references of that. The strong biblical uh, Bible di uh, dictionary also tells us Paran is the desert of Arabia. Cebius, a 7th century Armenian bishop and historian, when describing the Arab conquest, he said, uh, when well, we, we covered Cebius already, by the way, he said they assembled and came out of Paran. So it's as if he understood that was the Paran of the Bible. He understood they, they assembled and came out of Paran. Yeah. The Bible tells us that Paran is the very place where Ishmael dealt, uh, uh, dwelt 
while he, Ishmael, was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. The Talmud, look at the, look, this is the Talmud, the Palestinian Talmud states the following. 8,000 apprentice priests fled to the army. I, I've always had a problem pronouncing this king's name, yeah? Which is... Uh, Nebuchadnezzar. You guys say it. Can, can you say it? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, yeah? And they went to the Ishmaelites. They said to them, give us something to drink. We are thirsty. They brought them salty things and skins uh, bottles that were blown up with the air. They went to them, eat and drink. When one of them opened the skin and put it to his mouth, uh, the air was uh, in it, b uh, burst forth and choked him. And it was written the oracle concerning Arabia. Can you see? So this, this term Arabia is being used in, the, this is the Talmud. This is a Jewish source. Babylonian Talmud. Here you have it again. The one who sees Ishmael in a dream, his prayer will be heard. And only Ishmael, the son of Abraham, but an Arab in general, know the one who sees a camel in the dream. Death has been decreed upon him uh, 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 from heaven and he has been saved. So basically he's connecting Ishmael to where? To the Arabian Peninsula. Okay. So it's not Islam that came and connected Ish Ismail or Ishmael with the Arabian Peninsula. And in particular, Paran, the Arabian Peninsula. This seems to be continued from at least some level of biblical and Jewish uh, information that there was there. You see. So there's more than a book of Jubilees and Ishmael and his sons. The sons of uh, Keturah and their sons went together and dwelt from, from Paran to the entering in Babylon in all lands which is towards the east facing the desert. So it's telling you where it is now. It's towards the east facing the desert. And these mingled with each other and the name was called Arabs and the Ishmaelites. Now, very, very interesting. You're seeing here, we're seeing that they're asking what's the evidence that Mecca and all this kind of thing. And it's usually Christian sometimes asking this question. You know, your evidence is your own books. The evidence is in the, in the Jewish books. Now, uh, we'll come to this maybe near the end, but there are two schools of histor like, historical or historians when it comes to the Bible. There's what you call the minimalists and what you call the maximalists. Okay. Now, the minimalists are those who, when they're looking at the early histories of, especially Old Testament prophets, really and truly anything but Moses after, before Moses, there's scanty, if not in any evidence, of any prophet. That's outside the biblical or, let's say, religious books. You've got Moses, you've got David, you've got Solomon, you've got some other prophets, you've got the people of Israel. There's evidence of that, and we'll come to that, outside of the Bible. Okay? So a minimalist is the one who, when he wants to, when he wants to understand the early histories of these people, they will not consult the Bible that much. They will consult it minimally. The maximalists will consult it more. So what I'm saying is that this standard of evidence, where we're looking at the Talmud and we're looking at the Bible, it would satisfy a more maximally orientated historian from the school of thought perspective. Like, but it's still something. You can't say, oh, there's no, there's no evidence of Mecca. It's being attached to Ismail and the Arabs and so on. There is clearly evidence in there. And this is just some. I cannot give you more. But for, for brevity and conciseness, I only gave you some information. So when Dan Gibson says, oh, there's nothing connected to Mecca. Well, actually, there's things connected to Mecca way before. Ismail is connected to Mecca. Why is it coincidence? How could it be a coincidence that this narrative in the Quran, the narrative of the Quran, which, it, which locates Abraham and locates Ismail in particular and Hagar, Hajar, it locates these people in the Arabian Peninsula. There's ample evidence in Jewish sources and in biblical sources that connect them in the same area. Why there? If Muhammad Sallallahu is meant to have no relevance, if this is meant, if this is not actually a continuation, because the story of Islam is that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a continuity from previous prophets, and that he was from the sons of Ismail, as we're going to cover. But if this story was vacuous and it was completely, it made no sense, bereft of any historical quality. If this story was such 
then how could you find any evidence that corroborates it in their books? If this was some kind of made up story, this doesn't make any sense. Why would a Jew put that? Why would a Jew want to put the Arabs in there, in his, in his Talmud, of all places? One of his most his sacred places, he puts a, a Jew, but there, it smiles in Arab. No, sorry to say, uh, this, uh, we're not buying it. I mean, no one's going to buy this. Dan Gibson and talking about, look at Petra. No, let's be honest about the situation, man. And I was reading something interesting. And well, I found this extremely interesting. Isn't it? Because it's become fashionable in the Orientalist world. Some of the anti-Islamic apologists. And that's what they are. They're, they pose as academics, but really they're apologists for Christianity or they're anti-Islam apologists. For example, Stephen Shoemaker. And he wrote a book. I'm not going to advertise this book. But I'm going to mention some of the things he wrote in there. Because I found it really interesting. You know, in the Quran, for example, you will see the story of Jesus, okay? And you will know that the story of Jesus in the Quran is different from the ones in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Especially that, you know, Mary in chapter 19, you know, in Surah Maryam, she went to the palm trees and then the, the, the you know, the, the dates came on her and she shook the palm trees and she shook the, the palm trees. And you know the story. This story, by the way, is not in the in the Gospels. You will not find it in the Matthew, Mark, Luke. You will not find it in the in the Gospels of the Christians. But you will find it somewhere else. A close match to the story you'll find it in the Gospel of James. Now, Gospel of James, not the Book of James, the Gospel. Now, who is James? Just for the sake of argument, or just for the un understanding, James actually is meant to be, according to them, not according to us, but is meant to be the brother of Jesus Christ. They say he was the brother. They say Joseph the carpenter had a brother, uh, had a son, and, he, he, and that son was James. Anyways, there was this, the Gospel of James. This particular book was not being read, and according to Stephen Shoemaker, and I haven't done as much research on this matter as he has, he's trying to locate <laughs> this once again on goals and shooting themselves in the foot. And we saw in the beginning when Patricia Crona was talking about the landscape and the geography, you're going to see even more here. We're going to see even more with this, that really he's trying to locate Islam or the formation or development of Islam in the early, let's say, time, like 50 years at the time of Abd al-Malik and Marwan. And he said, look, there's a, there's a church. It's, it's a church in Jerusalem. It's, it's called the Kathisma Church. This particular church in Jerusalem, this particular church in Jerusalem, has very specific notions about Mary. In fact, the, you know the tree in the Quran that's mentioned that shake the tree and the dates will come down? They consider that tree to be even holy tree. They consider that tree to be a holy tree. And you know where it's located? Think about it. It's meant to be where the historical Jesus is. Like near Bethlehem or Jerusalem or whatever it may be. So it's actually meant to be, if, you, if you're being a historian about it, if you want to know what Jesus said, let's go to the geographic location. This is closer to where he lived. And listen to what he said. And I'm going to read exactly what he says. He says, this version, this version of how Jesus was born and Mary, it's so specific that Muhammad couldn't have known about it. It's not, at that time, you know, that, you'll see, I'm going to read it. He couldn't have known about it. And even, you know, Ya Ukhta Harun, it's mentioned in the Quran. Oh, sister of Aaron. And they, some of the Orientalists, they say, that shows you that there was confusion with Aaron and stuff. He says, the sister of Aaron is mentioned in that church. Look what they're doing, bruv. They're making our job easier. So, okay, maybe she had a sister called, her brother called Aaron. And now we have information of that. Have huh? I'm going to read it to you now. It's Stephen Shoemaker. And he thinks by, by saying this, he's making a case against Islam. Trying to show the development of Islam. And what he's actually showing is that it's impossible for the Prophet ﷺ to have had information that was connected in Jerusalem in a very specific church. And I saw an interview with him, with uh, another professor or uh, lecturer called Reynolds, or whatever, I can't remember his first name, Gerald Reynolds or something like that. And he's saying there's no child. He said, could a storyteller have told him? He said, there's no storyteller that can go into that much detail. But you know, he went to Syria when he was younger and he done this and he said, there's no chance. This is a very specific church in a very specific place. And this information came out. So I'm going to read out what he says. Because 
As I say, they shoot themselves in the foot without realizing. It says, the case of the Kathisma church and the Quranic nativity tradition in 922-28, Surah Maryam, Mari which I have discussed elsewhere in some detail, leaves little question that we must approach the Quranic text as a corpus of traditions to absorb Jewish and Muslim tradition, uh, sorry, Jewish and Christian traditions in the decades after the believers conquered and occupied the Near East. In these seven verses, the Quran gives highly compressed account of the birth of Jesus that depends on distinctive combination of Christian nativity traditions that is uniquely found outside the Quran only in the liturgical practices of a particular Marian shrine just outside of Jerusalem, the Kathisma Church. In the vast, in the vast world of late ancient Christianity, it's only at this church that we find the world of late ancient Christianity. It is only at this church that we find the, the combined two uh, early Christian traditions that appear in the Quran's account of nativity. Christ, Christ's birth in a remote location rather than in Bethlehem and Mary's refreshment by a miraculous palm tree and spring. For good measure, one must add the liturgical traditions of this same shrine uh, also explicitly name Mary as the sister of Aaron. See what he's saying here. He thinks he's making a case against Islam. He's saying, look, he must have borrowed it. He must have been around after. He must have borrowed it from these guys. There's no way they would have known about that church. Very specific church, very specific liturgy. Can you see how he's digging a grave for himself? You're making the case for me, my friend. He couldn't have known that information. You're right. And that information is most likely closest to the historical tradition of Jesus. Why? Because geographically it's closest to him, where he probably lived. He didn't live in Rome, uh, Roman Empire. Jesus, there is good evidence. Most historians, even atheists, acknowledge his historicity, by the way. But if his historicity is true, then most historians will say, go to his geographical location, go close to where he lived. And when you do that, you find the, the story closest to what? The Quran. And according to this guy, who's an anti-Muslim Orientalist, he's saying there's no way the Prophet could have known that. Let's see what, let's see what he says. At last, providing a clear solution to this well-known puzzle of the Quran, the correspondence between the Quranic passage, let me continue, and the tradition and liturgical practice of the Kathisma Church is simply too close yeah, to be a coincidence. Clearly the Quran knows and expects its audience to know this particular configuration of Christian nativity tradition. Not really. Not really. But that's what he wants to say. He's like, he's trying to locate it outside of Arabian Peninsula. He said, no way. It's meant, it must be. It's like the same argument that Krono was saying. Why is he mentioning olives? Why is he mentioning pomegranates? Why is he mentioning seas? Why is he mentioning the Sabbath? He's meant to be a Meccan surah. He's mentioning it because the primary audience is not the only audience. Why is he mentioning these details of that particular church? He's mentioning it because he couldn't have known that information and he got it from a different source. So listen to it, it continues. Nevertheless, there is no evidence that this particular fusion of traditions was known even among Christians. Listen to what he's saying. This particular fusion there's no evidence that it could, even Christians could not have known that. Who lived outside of Jerusalem and Bethlehem. It is therefore hard to believe, if not entirely unthinkable. Look what he's saying. He thinks he's making a case against Islam. He's making a very strong case. He's, he is better apologist, Islamic apologist, than any uh, I've ever heard. <laughs> Subhanallah, he's trying to harm Islam. He's really aiding it. He's saying it's unthinkable. He's, he's saying, no. He's a historian. He's looking. We trust this, this guy. So he's... He has no connection to Islam. When he's doing his, uh, his interview with uh, Reynolds or whatever, he's got Christian uh, pictures in the back and crosses and stuff. He's, you can see his ghil and anger towards Islam. He's angry towards anyone who has a confessionary narrative. This is what he's saying. Wallahi. Listen to what he's saying. It is therefore hard to believe, if not entirely unthinkable, that the Kathisma would somehow have been widely known among Muhammad's non-literate followers in the central Hijaz so that they could have had any chance of understanding the compressed and uh, elliptic reference to them in Quran 1922. Indeed, it boggles the mind to imagine that somehow this, this distinctively Jerusalemite combination of nativity traditions could have been widely known and understood by the hundreds or so illiteral early Meccan surahs, particularly when we find no evidence of any knowledge of this particular configuration of traditions anywhere else in late age ancient Christianity other than the Kathisma. 
The suggestion that somehow this distinctive mixture of traditions could have reached Muhammad and the citizens of Mecca and them alone in their barren hamlet strains cre credibility uh, strains credibility in the extreme. Because he wants to show that the Quran was not authored by Muhammad. It was authored by a conglomerate of authors and they came together and there was development and added and this. Instead what he's showing is, in fact, he couldn't have written this because that information couldn't have come to him. And that is a Quranic argument for the, for the veracity of Islam. And this is so, it's such a strong argument, it's mentioned in the Quran. Yes. Do they even accept uh, the Gospel of James? They don't know. So then, can they not say we, we, we reject it? Mm. We don't care what they accept because look, the thing, thing is, so what, yeah, it's a good question. It? So look, the Christian believes in a certain amount of books in the, in the New Testament because in the fourth century there's a guy yeah. called Athanasius yeah. who decided this is what's going to be in the, the book and this is what's not going to be in the book. This is what's going to be the New Testament and what's not going to be the New Testament. Now, we would say, even from your perspective, oh, Christian, how do you give this man such authority to include what's in the book and what's not? He can't turn around and say, Athanasius, it was a, it was a council. Because if they say it's a council, like the Council of Nicaea or the Council of Constantinople, you can see it's somewhat plausible. Okay, the church has been given authority. This is a single individual. So my single question is, what gives Athanasius that power? So for me, as a non-Christian, I don't need to throw everything away from Christianity. Just like historians have been using texts of the Bible in a minimally and maximal way, I have the right as a historian to look at it and say, well, actually, I'm going to look as a, as a historian, yes, at the sources which are closest to the geographic location which Jesus Christ is meant to be. I don't care about what Athanasius decided to be authoritative or not authoritative. I'm going to look at what's closest to Jesus. And when I do so, I find this actually, the descriptions of Jesus' birth is more in line with the Quran than your descriptions. He's going to say, no, but we don't accept it as Bible. I said, we don't care what you accept. We're talking, this is a historical discussion. It's not a religious one. We've already parked aside our religious biases. We're not talking from a confessionary perspective, faithful perspective. What Athanasius said, what Martin Luther said, what John Calvin said, who, what Augustine said. We don't care about these people. These are theologians. This is a historical exercise, not a theological one. That's what I would say to them. I said, when we look at the historical data here, if we are to believe that Jesus Christ actually existed, and we do believe that, then we, we have to look at what, he, what the evidences of uh, his existence were, what kind of uh, different narratives, and this is one of them. So, uh, uh, yeah. when was the Gospel of James, uh, what date are we looking at? I think so, yes. I think, I think we're Second century, what? Um, after Christ? Yeah, there's nothing before. Yeah. The, there's nothing in the first century, so I don't think it's in the second century. I think it's in the second century, but I don't know exactly the date, so we have to look at that. Yeah. Can I just mention something? I was going to say, because as we know, we believe that Islam came from, you know, Adam and Eve all the way till now. Mm. And I think when people say there's similarities between other religions and Islam, therefore Islam copied them, I think that actually plays in our favor because because we are, we've been there from day one. If there were, If there were no similarities, they would say, well, you say you were here from day one, but n nothing you say can be found in other religions. Sure. So it's, it's a good point. What you're saying, you can look at it two ways. The borrowing narrative or the, continu the theological continuity narrative. What I'm saying is that when you look at it from our perspective, we're going to say, look, the similarity is because Allah says in the Quran that he has sent these books before. So of course we expect there to be similarities. No problem. But what I'm saying is that when you have information like what we've just presented, it adds a layer of argument to the case here, a layer of historical argument. Can you see what's going on? It's not just like my, my, my word versus yours and I'm faithful in one direction, you're faithful in another. I'm saying, look, you're saying, what's the sister of Aaron about? I'm saying there's now historical information about the sister of Aaron. You're, you're saying, why is this in the Quran? I'm saying that's in other places where Jesus is meant to close to where he's lived. Now we're having a historical discussion. It boggles the mind of Shoemaker. There's, there's also, I don't know if you've seen, there's also, the, you know the whole replacement theory yeah. about uh, Isa alayhi salam being, you know there is some early Christians, I don't know if they're Unitarians, um, mm. have, you, have you looked into this, where they actually believe that this actually happened? Yeah, of course. Uh, there, there's, there's, they're not Unitarians, I mean like, a lot of it comes from the uh, Gnostic Bible and stuff like that. Yeah, so there are, it's, it's interesting, yeah. like from these different Bibles, they're, they're kind of proving, yeah, yeah. even yeah. though the Quran doesn't really say what happened, yeah. but one to see it is that basically Yeah, yeah that, so exactly, so, the substitution theory is, yeah. is there in, in, the, in this first, first century Christianity. Yeah. 
and uh, I think we're talking here about this. I cannot remember the name of the Gnostic writer. Obviously, they consider the Gnostics to be, to be heretics. So they'll say, we don't care. That's always the excuse with them. We say, we don't care what you consider to be orthodox and heterodox. Yeah. We are looking at things from a historical perspective. You're saying, okay, Jesus was crucified. We're saying, okay, let's take a look at it. Let, look at these differences. There's a substitution theory here. What the Talmud said, he was stoned. Why is there different results? results? Why is there different uh, reports? Yeah. So just from a historical perspective, the reason why we're inclined to this as a historian is just because geographically mm. speaking, it makes more sense. So we're looking at it from a geographical sure. perspective. Why not? Okay. Sure. Because the thing is, for us, the, the councils and stuff mean nothing. They mean nothing at all. Yani. So when we're looking at it, we're looking at just from, we're historians here. We're not looking at theologians. The Christians are always going to retort in a theological manner. We're saying, look, we've already decided to park the theological bus in order to perform this exercise, and we're doing it. And what you're seeing repeatedly is that when the historical critical method is applied to Islam, it comes with favorable results. When it's applied to Christianity, it comes with unfavorable results. That's really what's going on here. So let's, let's continue, because there's a few things I wanted to continue with you guys. So that's one thing, okay? You can continue reading these in your own time. Um, but I just want to say something quickly about hadith, because it's very important that we talk about this, at least briefly. We spoke about the historical critical method, we spoke about the revision, uh, and so on. But we have a method. Okay, we have a method. And, and the method is... It's in many ways very simple, but very, in very many other ways, many very complex. And the method for hadith to be sahih, yani for it to be authentic, then it has to fulfill five conditions. Three of them is are what we would call positive, and two of them we would call negative. Like, so the hadith has to be mutasil sanad, for example, it has to be connected. So such a person saw such a person saw such a person, such a person heard from such a person, heard from such a person the information. The people in that chain have to be adil. They have to have a good reputation. Which, and that goes into a great detail we're not going to be able to cover today. And they also have to be dubbed. They have to have dubbed or they have to have uh, a precision or accuracy. Now that dubbed is divided into two. Either when they write, what they're writing is legible and understandable. Because at the time when they're writing stuff, you can't write something in an illegible manner. Because then people would be like me, I'm very bad at writing, I would not qualify for someone, <laughs> unfortunately. Or, and or, their, their memory has to be very good. So if they're known for bad memory, they would not be accepted in the hadith. So these are the things, three things, which are pretty easy to do. Like, sorry to say, a student of knowledge can probably do that. Find, okay, this guy, look at the biographies of men, because how do you know? You know because these people's lives were effectively recorded in the early days of Islam, first two or three hundred years. And we have books of re recording, it's called Almur Rajal, of biographies of these people. Okay, so that this person lived in this place and this person lived in that place. And, he, and you'll find that there's embarrassing things that happen when people claim that hadith is narrated. And there's geographic inconsistency. Oh, I, I narrated the hadith from this person. But well, he lives in Syria and you live in Baghdad. How did that happen? Did you ever go there? And everyone there says, oh, we don't accept hadith, for example. So there's that. But there's also two things, which is a shudud. So aberration, and that can be with the Senate, it cannot, and I'll explain what that is, or illa, which is a defect. Now the illa thing is the most difficult thing. So difficult. Because what is a defect of a, how do you even classify what a defect of a hadith is? It can actually be a nasi defect. You can have a defect of the hadith in text. Yani the hadith can be sahih in terms of narration, but it goes against something established in the Quran, for example. I'll give you a famous example of this hadith of Turab, which is mentioned in Sahih Muslim. And if you look at the hadith, it's narrated by Kabul Ahbar. It says that, for example, Allah created uh, such and such Adam from dust and Adam was created on Friday. Yeah, it's a long hadith and it says something like that. And there's also Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, that kind of thing. So even though this hadith is in Sahih Muslim, which is one of the most authoritative books of hadith, Al-Bukhari himself rejects it. Al-Dara Qutni, who's seen as one of the great scholars of Ilal and stuff, he rejects the hadith. Why? He says it goes against the narrative in the Quran. And it sounds like Genesis. Now, he doesn't say this. But Kabul Ahbar was a Jew before. So, okay, you got a guy here who's a Jew. He converted to Islam. He's narrating a hadith. It sounds like Genesis, even though it's not the content is not the same. And it goes against the Quran. Al-Bukhari says, even though it's in Muslim, I mean, he doesn't say this, but he rejects the hadith itself. Dara Qutni rejects the hadith itself. Why? Because it has a illa, it has a defect within it. 
So this example, this is a very difficult thing to do because you can have illa in the nas, you can have illa in the, con the, 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 the content of the hadith, but you can also have illa or defect in the sanad. You can have a sh something shad in the nas and in the sanad. It's, it's like you can have it in the chain of narration and you can also have it in the actual content as well. Now this is the hardest thing to, because this is a falsification exercise. It goes negative, whereas to prove that the hadith is muttasil is easy. Okay, like we look at the biographies, these guys are not liars, they're not whatever, they're not mubtada or whatever. And even the mubtada has some rulings attached to him, by the way. He can narrate a hadith so long as he's not calling to his bid'ah and blah, blah. So he's mubtada, he's khawarij in that Bukhari, for example. So it's an interesting situation there. But, so there's very specific, logical, historical methods that are used here. Suffice it for me to say there's no equivalent in Christianity. You'll never find a single chain of narration that connects Jesus with anybody that's writing anything down. The religion of Christianity has not been preserved, therefore. And by the way, you, someone will say, well, that's not critical enough. If you imagine that Ahmed ibn Hanbal mentioned, for example, who died 241, he wrote, obviously, he compiled the hadith, Musnad Ahmad and so on, that he memorized a million hadith. Now, what does it mean to memorize a million hadith? He didn't memorize a million different wordings of the Prophet. He memorized, let's say, 10,000 hadith with 100,000 sanads. So what he's really memorizing is the chains of narration. He's not memorizing a million. Do you get it? He's just memorizing names and orders. He had, these guys had good memory. These guys, I mean, they had incredible memory. And it's not hard to believe. There's people that are doing that now. Stephen Shoemaker has a whole chapter trying to tell us how the Quran couldn't have been memorized. That, he said it's impossible for the whole Quran to be memorized. Except in a literature, in a, in, a, in a society where there's, and he tries to bring scientific uh, proofs. I say, what are you talking about, Akhi? And even I saw him in the, in, the, in the interview, and the guy was saying, but you get some ceremonies of some young nine-year-old memorizing the Quran. Yeah. He said, yeah, but that's only because they read it from paper. So I say, okay, now I, I was, I want to say, look, but I know some guys that taught me Quran, they were blind. <laughs> they they couldn't read it from paper, man. Wallahi, we had, we had a sheikh. Wallahi, he was blind sheikh. In Finsbury Park Mosque, yeah, everyone knows him, yeah, and he recites yeah. Quran every. You know what I'm talking about. Yes, I know. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I know. Akhi, I was, bro, his memory is spot on. Akhi. he doesn't make mistakes. Very rarely makes mistakes for Quran, and he's blind. You can't tell me this guy he learned from paper. Anyway, so he's trying to say that he, they want to rubbish the idea of human memory, because we live in an age of distraction. They think that people in the desert, they were distracted as we were. They were looking at stars and memorizing poetry, memorizing. That's all they had to do. Akhi. Talking about comparing this and that, and even now you have people that are memorizing this stuff. So anyway, the point is this: is that the the point I'm making is that they mem they, they knew, but more hadiths are rejected than they are accepted. Imagine you got a million hadith. How many Sahih hadiths do you reckon we have? And now we said about ten thousand, by the way. Like if you most of the ninety five percent of the hadith that are in the six books of hadith constitute what is what is authentic? What is authentic? So of, we, we've been so critical with the hadith that we've rejected 95% of them. We're the biggest hadith rejectors on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> we are. But we're not, Yani, we're throwing the baby with the bathwater. You know, there is, some, there is some caution that we must exercise it. But we're saying that there's more rejection going on. That's how critical they say, this is Ayla, this is Shev, this, this is not corroborating this. They're rejecting more than they're accepting. They're not happy to say because it's true. The Orientalists will say that people have political ambitions. The, the Umayyads may have had political ambitions. The Abbasids may have had the political ambitions. Uh, we accept. We accept. You're absolutely right. That's why we look at, we have a method, a criterion. Now compare this with the following, okay? The HCM method. Now, especially vis-a-vis -vis the biblical discourse. I'm going to give you something that, uh, according to Britannica, the historical critic. Uh, Historical criticism is the study of biblical literature method of criticism of the Hebrew Old Testament and the New Testament that emphasizes the interpretation of biblical documents in the light of contemporary environment. It draws upon not only exegesis and hermeneutics, but also the fields of history, archaeology, classical scholarship. So this is what we're doing here. Yeah, we're not just going for, I'm giving you a kind of a definition, right? Now look, they've got principles. And by the way, these principles were just developed recently, like maybe the last 100 years, 200 years, whatever. And by the way, it's so interesting that even according to those principles, Islam would be preserved. And I'll explain how. One of the principles is called the criterion of embarrassment. 
The criterion of embarrassment, for some reason, is a big thing to keep talking about. Is that if something is embarrassing to the person, he's, it's less likely that they would record it about themselves. Now, let me give an example. One of the things they mentioned is satanic verses. So, okay, so if we were in the business of throwing away hadith, why do we have satanic verses? So they bring satanic verses attacking Islam. I say satanic verses is, is, is an evidence of preservation of Islam. They bring Zainab bin Tajash. Now, this is a very interesting story. I'm not going to go into, we're going to go into it into more detail in a different story. But basically, uh, you know, Zainab bin Haritha, who used to be the, the adopted son of the Prophet, وسلم, and then he wasn't, he really, he has, there's no blood connection between him anyway, okay, that he divorced a woman called Zay, uh, Zainab bin Tajash. And then the Prophet وسلم, was told, really, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, according, to according to the hadiths and the Asbab al Nuzul of Wa Tubdi fi Nafsi kam Allahu Mubdi, in Surah Al Ahzab, chapter 33, verse 37. Which says that, and you concealed in yourself what Allah had exposed to you. That Allah exposed to him that you're going to get married to Zainab bin Tajash. But he didn't tell the people. Allah reprimands him for that in the Quran. And you fear the people. Allah is saying this to Muhammad. And you fear the people and Allah is more befitting that you fear him. Al-Hassan al-Basri said that if there was anything that was going to be concealed from the Quran, it would be this verse. It's very embarrassing. The Prophet ﷺ is about to marry someone who is uh, the wife of, in the society at that time, they considered it to be a big deal. Okay, he was your adopted son, how could you marry his ex-wife? How? Even now it's seen a bit weird, but it's not as weird as then, because there's no biological relationship. At that time, adoption was a big thing. So they, they considered that to be, at that time, it was a big deal. So much so, the Quran says, well, tubdi fi nafsi kam Allah mubdi. That you conceal within yourself what Allah is going to expose. Allah is saying, I'm going to expose it. And Hassan al-Basri is saying that actually, if there's anything that he was going to conceal about himself, it would be this verse. Tell me if this is not the criterion of embarrassment. So they use it to attack the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They don't realizing that they're actually positively making a case for the preservation of Islam according to their methods. Vis-a-vis -vis the principle of embarrassment. So this is an interesting thing. But when you apply it to Jesus and so on, what's, what's really there to be embarrassed about? When you, yani you could say, okay, well, the principle of embarrassment, they need that stuff. We don't, we don't need this. We don't need this for the preservation of Islam. We have biographies of men, this person, where he was, where he lived, where he ate, where he done. We're going to accept his hadith based on this. Basically, he's got a criminal record. A DBS check has been done on all the biographies of men. And you're telling me about the principle of embarrassment? That's how you're going to tell me that the Bible is preserved? You're telling me about that principle there? That even if you employ it, then you're going to exonerate the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not that, but you're going to make a case for the preservation of Islam according to your methods. Everything has a hikmah. You say, why did Allah allow such a thing? Why did Allah allow the Prophet to marry such a woman? What's the hikmah of it? Maybe this is one of the, one of the hikam. That so it can be a bolstered argument for the preservation of Islam according to their methods. They have other criterions which is quite similar. There's one called the criterion of dissimilarity, originality, or irreducibility. So it's quite similar. And they use the baptism of Jesus and stuff like that as, okay, well, because according to their theology, the one who's baptizing, who in this case was John the Baptist, is better than the one being baptized. They say, look, how could it be that Jesus is being baptized? It would indicate his inferiority, but still the story is told, which indicates dissimilarity here. Do you see what I mean? But anyway, that... that it's pretty weak in terms of historical. Let's be honest about this. And then, we know this as well, the principle of multiple attestation. It comes from different sources. And we, of course, have Al-Hadith Al-Aziz, Al-Hadith Al-Mashur, Al-Hadith Al-Mutawatir, as everyone knows. Most hadith are not actually gharib. People think that a had hadith, which is a hadith supposedly narrated by one chain of narration, one chain of narration, is only narrated by one person. That's not true. And Ahad Hadith, not Ahad, but Ahad Hadith is divided into three. Al-Gharib, Al-Aziz, and Al-Mashur. And uh, Al-Gharib, Al-Gharib, has two or more people narrating the Hadith. So the Shia attacked Abu Huraira, and he said, look, he's, why is he making all these Hadith? He's the most narrated person of Hadith. How could he narrate so much Hadith? So interesting, because if you use the principle of attestation, or multiple whatever, what's it, what do they call it here? The, the principle of multiple uh, 
attestation, yeah? If you use the principle of multiple attestation, even by the historical critical method standard, did you know that more than 95% of the hadith, and there's some studies that I can cite on this, that were narrated by Abu Huraira, when narrated by somebody else? So it must have been some grand conspiracy. Because most of the things that Abu Huraira said, at least one other person said the same thing about what he said. Because the, the, the false assumption is that he's saying this hadith by himself, but actually at each tabaqah there's two guys, gharib. It's not gharib, it's aziz. It's, 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 it's aziz or mashur. Two or three or more. Mutawath even. So we're talking about multiple attestation. Now you apply this to the Bible, there's nothing in the first hundred years. So what they're compelled to do is talk about Q source and L source and M source and that source and, that, and all these sources in the second century. So they say, okay, these are independent sources from each other. But how can you be sure that they're independent from each other in the first place? Because there's no chain of narration. When we talk about independence, we're talking about guys that live completely different place, different human beings, different biographies. And they have different... You cannot even employ their historical critical method. We have absorbed all of it. So tell me which is more critical. We're saying the Hadith method is more critical than their method. Their principles of multiple attestation and principles of embarrassment and principles of whatever, dissimilarity, we, our ones are stronger. So why do you think you're being more skeptical than we are? We're skeptical of your skepticism. And moreover, not only are we skeptical of, our, of your skepticism, we employ all your methods of skepticism to reach even more staunch and stern conclusions about the veracity of hadith or lack thereof. And look at the historicity of Jesus Christ. E.P. Saunders, he wrote a book called The Historical Figure of Jesus. And he said that if you remove the Bible, you've, you've got a figure of Jesus Christ that's a very like, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, Yanni, but he's, he's basically an obscure figure, Yanni, in, in, in Bethlehem. Yanni, he's an obscure figure. You've only got, by the way, you've got two people that are oft repeated, uh, oft quoted as, uh, uh, sorry, as, as, um, uh, as, as figures that are outside the, uh, outside the Christian corpus for the historical character of Jesus Christ. But we won't go into that. We, we can go into that maybe some other time. And one of them anyway is interpolation in his works and the Christians tried to put the baptism and the crucifixion in there and stuff and then it was really, yani, seemed to be a forgery. And even that, they're putting forgeries in there. Yani, even the, even the non-Christian sources, the Christians, are, they're doing tahrif not only of their own books but the books of other people. They have no business with tahrif on it. They're corrupting, the, it's like I'm corrupting my own Bible now. I'm going, no, to the Bhagavad Gita, corrupting that one as well. Why are you corrupting other people's books? <laughs> Why are you corrupting? <laughs> because you're, you want to force a theological narrative. Interpolation, interpolation, anything to do with Christianity. I always hear the word interpolation and corruption. Nothing is preserved of their religion. Bits and bobs here and there. But look at the historicity of Moses. Now, many people will know that, Yani, if we, if we go back to the idea of uh, lo looking outside the Bible, there is a stele, this rock, and this one's actually in the museum, the Egyptian museum there. Look, it's, it's, uh, we have something in our, in our museum. <laughs> That's a very important artifact. Now, it's dated 1213 to 1203 BCE. And in that stele, Merampatah, on the 13th line, it says the people of Israel, and they were expelled. And Merampatah was the son of whom? Ramses II. Okay, so this is what, scanty evidence, quite frankly. Scanty evidence. And there are about four stelas with the words children of Israel on it. But that does show you it's not a myth. Because you can't tell me Gilgamesh and this one and that one now myth. Because now we're locating it in a time and place. Sorry to say. Don't tell me it's a myth. How is it a myth? Who forged the stela? Did someone come in there and put hieroglyphics and forge that one? But if it's not forged, and wallahi, and this could be a, a thing with a session by itself, wallahi, if you look, read, for example, there's a guy called Israel Finkelstein. He's more, he represents not Norman Finkelstein, the one I spoke to about Palestine issue, no. There's another guy called Israel Finkelstein who's, who represents the minimalist school in the historical thing. And they look at these steles and stuff like that. And there's another stele, because we know that David, he came after Moses. David and Solomon. And there's a stele called the Tel Dan stele. A very, very, very interesting stele. And it says in it, the house of David. Because before that, the minimalists were saying, and this shows you, the arguments for silence can actually backfire in your face in a bad, a bad manner. People like Israel Finkelstein and others from the minimalist school of historical investigation, they were saying, look, there's no evidence of the David. There's no evidence of him. Outside the Bible, there's nothing. 
Then the stele came out to life, called the Tel Dan stele, which is a rock on it, with Hebrew language, and said the house of David. They translated that. He had to come back a bit and retract. There is evidence now, actually, for that. So there's evidence for Moses. There's evidence for David. Yes, there is. But if you look at the minimalist accounts and the reasons why, and this could be a thing by itself, wallahi, it's so unbelievable. The reasons why they reject the biblical narrative is because they say, for example, how could this many people from Israel go to Egypt? That would be an event that would be codified in other places. But the Quran says that Pharaoh, for example, says that the home uh, that there were a small number of people. So if you look at the Quranic narrative and compare it with the minimalist accounts, you'll find that the criticisms that the minimalists use against the maximalists and the biblical narrative don't actually apply to the Quranic narrative, which is a whole layer of historical evidence for the veracity of Islam, which we can't go into now. But what I'm saying is that when you realize that these prophets were not myths, that's a very, very significant thing. You're talking outside of the purview of the Bible. This is extra biblical information. So we know now Moses existed. We know, okay, there's the children of Israel. There's Steelers that say it. Let's talk about David. Let's talk about Solomon. But we also know that the accounts of the biblical discourse are, are faulty. But then when you compare, you're talking to us about the historicity of Muhammad. And these some Christians, apologists, actually make this point. Historicity of Muhammad. Compare the historicity of Muhammad وسلم, with any of the prophets that existed before him. Jesus, Moses, Abraham, nobody. There's too much evidence. And so with that, um, I think we've covered most, if not all, of the of this. Yes, we have covered everything. We have covered all of... How many hours was that? How long was it? Yeah, we, uh, as I said, it will tell us how they... Uh, now we'll open up the questions, inshallah, yeah? Yeah. What well, if someone uh, would argue that the one criticism of the hadith is that they accept the supernatural, while the historical critical method does not accept it, so they're more probabilistic than the hadiths? And both scientific or science and history, they believe in something or they, they employ something called methodological naturalism. Yeah, So that what you, you cannot verify a, natu a, a supernatural event. They, so, yani, it's, a, historical's job, a historian's job is not to say this happened or this did not happen. It's a, historical, a historian's job is to tell you what people said happened. That's his job. How does he know it happened or not happened? Think about it logically. If I wrote, I saw such and such, I saw a man uh, levitate. I went this place, I saw a man levitate. Now, I wrote that journal, I wrote it, I put it down. I go to my psychologist, he said, look, were you taking a hallucinogen? I said, no, I wasn't taking a hallucinogen. I saw the man levitate. Was the man on strings? Was he a magician? Was this, was that? You can have whatever theory you like. But if I claim that a man levitated, you must accept that this is a, t a, t is a testimony. So when we have a range of different things, you can have whatever theory you want about it, but the testimony is what we're looking for, not necessarily the interpretation of the testimony. So yes, uh, there's a discussion there, but it's not the historian's job to talk about the possibility of a historical event or a natural, uh, supernatural event. His job is just to narrate what, they, what was said that happened, not what the interpretation of that might have, might have been. I just want to say the... <coughs> The Exodus in the Bible is 600,000 people that left. Exactly, yes. Yeah, which is a mind-blowing number. And a lot of uh, historians said that that figure is completely wrong. Exactly, yeah. Absolutely wrong. Yeah, exactly. So this, this is especially the minimalist school. They will say, it's, uh, how is it that 600,000 people crossed the, uh, the sea? And Gani, Moses split the sea in 600,000. What happened? And you're telling me that no one wrote this? Yeah. And there was only one line in the sea of Marampata? But the Quran says, Shredimatun Qalilu. There were a small band of people, which makes much more sense. It would, so the criticism that is levied at that particular kind of thing is not cannot be levied at that the the Quranic account. Mm -hmm. mm. I may have missed in your talk, but um, I was going to say about the coins that you were talking about. Um, you said that they had like Allah His name written on it, yeah. but but didn't the Quraysh already believe in Allah? Before the Prophet ﷺ. So they, they, what, couldn't it be of that like? The thing is, they, they believed in Allah, but they didn't have the formulations Lillah, Bismillah, like the Basmala and stuff like These are unique to Islam. Ar-Rahman. Ar-Rahman and stuff. But I don't know if Ar-Rahman was in any of the coins. I have to look at Ar-Rahman if he's in a coin for sure. But that's one thing. But another thing is the following, is that they had other gods. So why, why is it only, we don't find a let in any of them. We don't find a coin with Al-Uzza on it. 
يعني المنات الثالثة الأخرى why not with the coin with the manat on it do you know what I mean so that's actually a very good point because it's not only what we find it's what we don't find like we don't find coins with manat on it for example mm -hmm. so today is basically just looking at the historical um, relevance uh, as in like proving the Prophet existed historically yes. and not the question of whether these historical accounts are true or not just showing to historians these narratives exist outside of um, uh, Quranic texture or Hadith texture, yeah, essentially. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we're taking, remember, this the intellectual seerah is an attempt to look at each and everything that someone can say, taking it seriously. And so that if someone comes to you and says to you, like, how do you prove Prophet Muhammad exists? You can easily just rattle them off the Arabs, uh, the, the fragments of the Arab conquest, uh, 636, uh, uh, Thomas the Press Party, 640, CBS 6, uh, 662, whatever it may be. You know, or you, uh, the, the the inscription of Zohair uh, 24. You, you, you can just say stuff like that and just... What are they going to say? What are they going to say? And if they deny these historical premises, then then you'd have to counter by saying what historical premises do you believe when it's like a philosophical argument but from a historical lens, is that... Exactly. Because the thing is, if they start denying this, yeah, then it, we would just say, let's apply your yeah. methodology to all of history. Let's see what happens. Exactly. Let's see what happens. Yeah. Like, uh, and then I can even be uh, audacious about it and start mentioning genocides and stuff just to to get them in trouble. Mm. No, no, honestly, because if, you, if you're going to start denying this That's stuff, true. like yeah. the existence of one person or a group of people that believe in a certain thing is just a, a very it's a very easy thing to substantiate, right? Compared to the actions of people against another people and how many people and this kind of details. So I would, uh, I think it's an easier case to make, even though there's a historical gap. Mm. I had a question regarding the uh, Jews in Medina, Yathrib. Yeah. Do we have any work from them, any things they've written, anything they've produced? No. I, I don't, uh, to be honest, all we had is like Talmud and uh, the oral tradition. But the oral tradition, the Talmud and stuff like that, they were codified much after, Je like much after Jesus. I don't think anything was written at the time of the Prophet in his vicinity from them that survives with us. Mm -hmm. I don't think there is anything. About, I have to look again at that. Uh, but having said that, if you look at the Jewish Encyclopedia, which is a secondary source, they, they're happy mentioning people like Abdullah bin Sabah and uh, other, <laughs> other figures like that and saying, hey, Abdullah bin Sabah existed and uh, this one existed and that one existed. So uh, scholars of Judaism, okay, and who rely on, you know, these kinds of methods, they affirm this stuff happened. But in terms of primary sources that we can go back to, I haven't seen anything, do you know what I mean, that's... That's there, like, or, or, or an Old Testament or something that existed at the time. I don't think that, I don't think we have one. We don't, there is not one. Actually, there, there actually is not one. There is not a, a, a Bible at the time of the Prophet that has been excavated or that's even been mentioned by anybody. I'm not making an argument from science, therefore it doesn't exist, but I'm saying till this time, we haven't found it. It's not been mentioned. Okay. And I also just wanted to say, I think the Christians would be scared if we find anything from the time of Jesus, because it would be very monotheistic, like it wouldn't have any reference to the Trinity. So I don't think they would wish for us to discover any manuscripts. The yeah. archives, maybe. Yeah, they're hiding it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why. Maybe, Allah, well, like, it's not, it's not, all the interpolation that's taken place in history, I don't see it. And remember that there are lots of Christian uh, apologists in power. The Republican Party, this one, that one, the, the Vatican, whatever, they can easily hide this stuff and burn it. If they saw something that said, like, is in line with the Islamic narrative, they might burn it. Yes. It's very possible. One time I was reading a historian where he said like the Prophet Muhammad some maybe knows five languages and he knows all of these stuff. Uh, why is it so hard for them just to believe at that point? When they saying he knows all five languages, he knows all the like he had materials of things from Egypt from uh, what, what, what's left. And that's that what you're saying there is a Quranic argument because when he said that the 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 and this is an Arabic text. So, so the language skill thing is a big thing, bro. Because you're, it's not like the Jews are making it easier. It's not like they have a proselytizing religion. They want to make it easier for the Arabs to know what they're about. They're, they're not inter interested in converting people to Judaism. They've never been interested in that, actually. Mm -hmm. And so why would... It's not... Yani, whatever's going to be in their language is going to most likely, especially at the technical level, stay in their language. So for you to say it's not going to, it's going to be in a different language, you'd have to say that he knew technical Hebrew and theological Hebrew. That's why people like Shoemaker and stuff are, are telling you this is impossible that he could have known this much detail for a storyteller or something other than that. 
Um, I just got a question about the manuscripts part of your speech. Um, so you know you said how they carbon date back to the to the prophet yeah. and stuff. Yeah. There's actually one or two of them that carb uh, they're carbon dated before the prophet was born. How yeah. how would you answer that question? Well, look, the, the carbon dating works in a particular way where you don't know exactly what time period it is. So they're saying five six eight six whatever six six five or whatever it was, right? And we said that Prophet Sallam died 632, so it's within the time. But there's going to be an area there where we don't know. And then there's a question of with carbon dating, because there's a, there's a particular carbon. How they do it is, there's a carbon called carbon-19. And they look at how it disintegrates and how, I don't know how exactly scientifically it works. But they look at this carbon-19 and how it functions and whatever. But you can either carbon date the parchment or you can carbon date the ink. So in this case, I think the carbon dating, of, for example, the Birmingham manuscript was of the of the parchment, not the ink. So some of them have said, for example, on the Birmingham parchment, they say, why are you why are you carbon dating the parchment and not the ink? Because and even some Islamic uh, scholars have said, look, actually the ink or well, the style of the writing doesn't indicate the Hijazi style which you would expect, yani, from the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, for example. And even be that as it may, it doesn't matter to me. Because what I'm saying is that if there's a manuscript that, that that falls within that time period, and it's a piece of, it's a it's a leather strap or a leather, a parchment, or whatever, whatever material it was, then that's significant from your perspective. It's significant. Now, what's carbon dated? This one's not carbon dated. It's carbon dated, but it falls within that time period. It falls within that time of the Prophet Muhammad's life. I think what you're saying is basically, you know, the skin. Yeah. Let's say the skin. The deer was killed twenty years ago, mm. and then. The Quran was revealed 25 years later. Mm. They carbon date the skin and yeah, say, yeah. oh, it was before the Prophet. But it's not, no, that's where the deer may, may have been killed, but the skin was used 25 years later. Mm. So that's where they say, oh, this goes back to the Prophet was before he was born. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't think they say it's before, there's just the range. And some yes, of the exactly, range is before. Some no, but of the what, range. what Ali's saying is also. Like Jay, Jay Smith will come to the park. Yeah, they've claimed yeah. actually this is written before the Prophet said. They say, yeah. so, so they show, they say, oh, there was somebody else who. Uh, uh, no, no, you're, 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 you're both right. You're both right. Because it could be a range. And it could be that the skin was there for 20 years. Before, yeah. And then someone wrote on it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it. They preserve those kinds of skins and stuff like that. You can know you can write on them. So it's it's all possibility possibilities. But if you look at the Orientalist narrative, they're saying that he died not actually six thirty two. He died after. Some of them are saying he died after. There was not a Bakr. The Prophet lived at the time of uh, Jerusalem uh, conquest, for example. So I'm saying that Yani, how do you explain this now? It becomes problematic. And I'm saying that even Patricia Crona, I think from what I read, and I have to double check this, the reason why she actually ended up changing her mind was not even the Birmingham manuscript which is more voracious here it was actually the Sana'at manuscript the palimpsest assessed. it wasn't even that one so uh, yani, the, the point is it was enough to get her who is the, yani, the forerunner in making this sceptical theory to reverse her theory <coughs> do you know the I believe it was the letter the prophet um, sent to Constantine the Roman emperor um, is that part of the historical Heraclius, Her Heraclius not Constantine, yeah, the sorry, the Heraclius. Different letters, I need to look at the authenticity of them and the manuscript evidence of them because I don't know if... Well, obviously, we have yani, uh, narrations from our perspective, but from their perspective, if we're looking at it from a manuscript perspective, I don't know... I think the letter was... It could oh, be, but I have, to, I, have yeah. to look at, I have to look at it. I have to look at it. I have to okay. double check. Well, we have the letters. I mean, we, ha we have the letters and obviously it's in our hadith and so we believe in them and all that kind of stuff. But I'm saying... Yani, the manuscript of it, I want to see how old those manuscripts are. Uh, uh, part of the, when you read it, they said the Tayaya. Tai, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tai, yeah. Apparently that's an uh, Arab tribe. It's called Tai. And it's very popular. And I'm actually from that tribe that yeah. they're referring to. But it's a very popular tribe in the Levant. So that's why they said instead of using Arab, they used the name of that tribe. Really? Yeah. yeah I mean... Once again, in that language, I have no clue. So, is the yeah, yeah, that's Arabic, but it's Syriac, so, so I wouldn't yeah. know like that particular... Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to make a comment on that because, you know, online is a very staunch place, so <laughs> you don't want to make a mistake on these kind of things. I know there is some level of controversy, but what's his, what's his name? Is it Hoyland or what's his name? Hoyland, yeah. Robert Hoyland. Hoy, is it Hoyland? Robert Hoyland. Yeah, he translated it as uh, the Arabs of Muhammad or... He translated it in that way. And his in his very much reviewed. It's a very heavily reviewed 
work. So I would expect people that I'm not a Syriac expert, someone who is a Syriac, why would they let him slide on that? Do you know what I mean? Like, so that's how I would put it. Did you feel, how do you feel after the first session? Do you feel like is it you, you're armed now with information, which is pretty strong? What do you guys think of the, the Kathisma church? And uh, that was... A, yeah, well, that was, that, the church one was really good. Yeah. That, that was like bang on. I think the only criticism they'll have is like, oh, I don't believe in the historical, like my historical perspective is I don't agree that it should be a geographical or I don't believe this brand of, uh, this strand of, Christianity, but then it's you know it's the question is like okay, then the, it's then beside the point. Yeah, theology here we're talking about history. Yeah, then. exactly. Yeah, we always so. have to remember remind them that this is a historical exercise, not a yeah. theological one. Yeah. Can you send this again? That screenshot looked very um, distorted. Yeah, man. Can you send Which it? One? The clear, the one he's reading from oh, about the. Oh, okay. okay, okay can you yeah. send a bit send, more clear? Send us the actual PowerPoint yeah. that you prepared. Oh, yeah, yeah, I did. It's in the group. No, no, no. Send us a clearer shot. That looked very. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'll and try. the coin as well, that was quite interesting seeing the, the yeah. Prophet's name written and the yeah, Basmala yeah, so on it. That was, they're, that was, they're everywhere. You can buy this for 90 40 years after his, his, his passing? Uh, 670, you said? That coin? About 50 years, actually. 50 years, yeah. So no, 65 AH, I think, is the first okay. coin with his name. Okay. So we, 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 if you die 11 AH, what is it? 50, 54 years, yeah? Mm. 54 years. The best thing for me was the sister of Harun. Yeah, that yeah. for me is. Because they usually attack that point. In the yeah. Quran, they say oh, you mistakes with Harun alayhi yeah, salam. Exactly, yeah. Also, but it actually proves Islam. Very interesting, 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 isn't it? But so, with all that having said, um, the next kind of sessions we're going to do we talk about the virtues of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And what we're going to do, I'm going to be when we're going through the life. This is not a typical thing, like storytelling style. I'm going to be using a particular book of Sirah. There was a genre of Sirah books called uh, the Authentic Sirahs, basically. And there's one that I like, it's called, uh, it's, it's one by Ibrahim Al-Ali. Yeah. And it's very, very difficult. It's about 600 pages long. It's very, very difficult to go through all the seerah without going through weak hadith because the seerah is filled with weak hadith. I'm not sure if <laughs> you're aware, but the seerah is filled with weak hadith. And so when someone narrates the seerah, they're going to narrate it with a lot of weak hadith. Now, I'm not going to do that. Not because it's not a legitimate way of narrating the seerah. That is the way to narrate the seerah. But because we're not in a typical seerah class here, we're in an intellectual seerah. So we're going to be telling stories, but we're going to be limiting it effectively to the authentic hadith. Not because the weak hadith or the weaker hadith in authentic hadith, they have no place in seerah telling and history and all that kind of stuff. Just because uh, we, we have objectives in this particular class, which is to kind of get the strongest things so that we can tell the strongest story. That's effectively what it is. Until next time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.